Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. And today we're taking a look at a very unique product being an Abastack. That's A-double-B-A-S. Abastacks are a unique, custom, sort of one-of-a-kind type DAC where each unit is a little bit different from any of the others because they're made from new old stock parts. They use tubes. Yes, this is a tube DAC as well. And so they're a very unique design. This review has been made possible by patron of the channel, Michael. So thank you, Michael, for lending me your Abast for a couple of weeks. This specifically for anyone interested is the Abbas 2.2 SE and the numbers used for the Abbas DAX like the 2.2 here, that relates to the chip being used rather than a kind of progression of the product. So a 4.2 or 4.1, whatever the number might be, doesn't mean it's a later, better model DAC necessarily. It means it uses a different chip. Now, what some of this does mean is that the information on the Abbas website isn't as specific as I might like when I'm researching for something like this. And the reason for that is that every single product is a little bit different. So there's not a listing that says the 2.2 SE does X, Y, and Z with these details, these specifications, etc. There are some things that are, of course, consistent, but there's also a lot of variability. So I'm going to tell you what I can today. I'm going to paint a bit of a picture of what this deck is like, both in terms of how it's put together, what makes them a bit unique, but then most importantly, of course, is talking about how it sounds. Hiding. Everything No doubt one of the first things you noticed when you started this video was that there are two boxes on the desk next to me. And that's because the Abbas DAX use SPDIF only, and specifically RCA or coaxial SPDIF. What that means is that if you do want to use it with a USB source, you're either going to need a digital to digital converter, or you can actually buy a USB to SPDIF converter from Abbas themselves. That's what Michael has, and he was kind enough to lend me that as well. And so let's start with a quick tour of the converter, and then I'll show you the DAC. One thing to cover off while they're both facing you is that the front panels of these units are very, very simple, very, very elegant, I think. Those of you that like displays and bells and whistles, you're going to be disappointed. But other than that, the SE version here has this beautiful gloss black. It's actually like a piano gloss finish with just the metal plate saying Abbas in the middle. If we turn around the Spitoff converter, what we've got on the back here is this beautiful kind of gold finished panel. You've got an IEC mains connector, a power switch, a USB-B input, and then you've got your Spitoff output. So this is very, very simple. It's just going to take an input and spit out a spit of output. So USB in, spit of out. But this is interestingly enough, also built on tubes. And I find that really fascinating. Essentially, this is a digital to digital converter, but there's multiple tubes, I think four from memory, running on the inside of here. And one of them's even the clock. So this uses an ECC88 tube as the clock, which I'd never heard of doing that with a tube before. I've never really looked into it before, to be honest, but it was really surprising to me when I read the notes and discovered that the E88CC or ECC88 is the tube that's actually doing the re-clocking. And rather than saving it for later in the sound quality section, I will mention that as well as using this with the Abbas stack, I did also use my Singer SU6, which is a more fully fledged digital to digital converter or DDC. And I found that the Singer did sound just a little bit better to me than the tube converter but it is preferential. I liked the fact that I felt like the SU6 had a bit more body and kind of weight to the sound behind it. It was a bit more authoritative, but there was a certain delicacy to the sound from this DDC, that being the Abbas one, that some people are going to love. And so I just wanted to flag that this is bringing some level of coloration to the sound because it's tubes probably. And so even though it is a digital to digital converter, there is some kind of alteration in the sound going on as a result but there's actually nothing wrong with the sound that comes out of it. It's one of those things where if I wasn't comparing it, I never would have picked that there was any coloration at all. It was only in comparison to the SU6 that I started to notice anything. And so if you are buying an Abbas DAC and you want the matching converter, it is a wonderful, perfectly good converter. It just doesn't have as many features as something like the Singer, and it does have a little bit of its own coloration. So keep that in mind. You don't have to buy this with the Abbas. You can run it from any coaxial input. 
Having put this bit of converter over the back now, let's take a look at the DAC. And as you can see here, things are pretty simple on the DAC as well. We've again got mains over here, we've got a power switch, we've then got our spit of input over on the far side, and a pair of RCA outputs next to it. And that's all there is to it. There's no volume controls, there's no preamp functionality here. This just takes an incoming spit of signal and puts out an analog signal through the RCAs. So it's single ended all the way, there's no bells or whistles whatsoever, just in theory, fantastic sound, and we'll get to that soon. One other thing that I want to talk about before we get to that though, is the fact that there are some fascinating things going on in terms of the design and what's gone into the Abbas DAC. And some of these are listed on the actual website. As I said, the specifics for every unit, whether it's a 2.2, a 4.4, a 3.1, whatever it might be, there's not specifics for a unit by unit breakdown, but some of the things that are being done in terms of the technology going into these is quite fascinating. Some of it's going to be quite esoteric and some people are going to question that there's any validity in it from a sonic point of view. And I'm not here to question that. All I care about is whether it sounds good at the end. But the sorts of things that are being done and the lengths that the designer of these is going to is to find things like a special form of varnish to go over the PCB. That's the actual board that all the circuitry is connected to. Each component, like a resistor for instance, is tested because theoretically, according to the designer of these, the orientation of those devices can alter their sound. So every single component, according to the website at least, every single component is tested to find its best orientation before it's installed in one of these DACs. So that's an extreme length it's gone to, to make sure that these sound as absolutely optimal as the designer thinks they can. Another really interesting thing that I noticed, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but when you look at some of the devices inside here, there's the component itself, and then you'll find there's a little bit of metal stuck on top of it, or there's a little wire connected next to it, and it clearly isn't a normal piece of circuitry. And what it turns out that it is, is the design of the Abbas DAX has taken pieces from old vacuum tubes, so that he's broken apart the tube, he's broken the glass, pulled pieces out, things like the grid from inside, and he's cut those up or kept them intact, I'm not sure, but the point is he's taken those pieces of the tubes and stuck them to the tops of components. According to him, it's making a difference to the sound, and I'm not one to sit here and question that because I've listened to enough different audio devices to know that strange things can have effects on audio. And so I'm not going to for a second say whether it's a right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but I think it's really interesting. And the fact that so much care and attention has been taken, that in itself is worth something to me. Now, obviously, if it's doing absolutely nothing and someone could prove that, then that might be another question. But I love the fact that there's so much care, so much attention. There's a bit of eccentricity to this device, and it's kind of cool. Of course, none of that really matters if it sounds like trash, if it just sounds thick and muddy and yuck, like it's been put together with a bunch of crappy parts. That would be a whole other story. But we're going to get to that in a moment, and I'll explain the fact that it doesn't have that issue at all. It's actually a lovely sounding DAC. But the final thing I want to mention is that the 2.2 SE here is built on the quite famous Philips TDA 1541A chip. This is one of the very earliest ever DAC chips. It's a very well regarded DAC chip that a lot of people think is one of the best DAC chips ever made. Whether it is or not, I'm going to leave that up to other people to debate. But the point is it's built on a DAC chip with great reputation. It's then again got tubes inside the DAC, as I've already mentioned. So there's multiple tubes inside here. I think again it's four. I can't remember. I didn't count them before I closed it up again. But ultimately what we've got here and what I'm about to tell you about the sound quality from is a tube spit of converter, so USB to spit of converter, feeding into a tube DAC built on mostly, if not all, new old stock parts or NOS parts. So these are all kind of vintage old school parts put together with tubes and all to create a DAC with a very unique kind of personality. And so let's talk now about what that personality is. Trying to work out what gear you should buy next? Have a look at the Passion for Sound Recommends link down in the description below. Clicking on the link will take you through to my Patreon page, and specifically a post where you can click on the Airtable image to go through to my recommended product database. Once you're in the database, you can use the filter button up the top to choose which sorts of product types you want to have a look at. Maybe headphones, maybe DACs, maybe amps. Choose the one or ones that you want to see from this list. And then you can also sort the list by price if you want to, or other features as well. You'll then see a consolidated list just of the product types you want to have a look at, including things like what the retail price was when I last checked. You've got links to my reviews of each product, and then also links to where you can go and buy them. Feel free to play around with the filters and sorting options as much as you like to find the gear you're looking for, and I hope that this database points you in just the right direction for you. So happy hunting, happy listening, and now let's get back to the review. The sound from the Abbas DAC really struck me immediately as being articulate and fluid. 
it just kind of has this ease to it, which is very common for me in recent listening to a lot of different tube devices. It's very common in tube devices. They just have a sense of ease and organicness to them. They just kind of flow with the music in a way that a lot of solid state devices don't do. And that's not to say that I think tubes are better. They're just different. But that's the character that I really like about tubes, as opposed to some of the things I like about solid state, which are things like the sense of texture, detail and resolution. I do think solid state tends to win out there when you're comparing kind of like for like in terms of pricing. But in the case of the ABBA stack here, it's definitely giving this wonderful kind of fluid and articulate sound. And I think that articulation point is key. So whilst it's not the most resolving deck that I've ever listened to, it's still very, very good in that regard. Listening to it in isolation based on some tracks that I just know and understand well, what I was aware of was that it's got a slightly lean sound in the bass. It's not that it's completely lacking bass, but it sort of focuses you on the mid-range and it does lean towards being just a little bit mid-range focused and therefore pulling back on the sense of bass presence. It's not a rich, warm, full sounding deck from a bass point of view but it does still have a lovely sense of mid-range quality to it. So those that love vocals, those that love a mid-range that kind of comes forward and really drags you into the music, that's where the Abbas could be great. Overall, the sound is natural, it's enjoyable, it's engaging. And that forward mid-range that I spoke about before, that results in a very kind of well-focused image. That central image is really strongly presented and it makes it very easy to engage with the music. It's worth mentioning at this point that I'm not clear exactly the price for an ABBA stack brand new. I know Michael picked this one up somewhere in the range of three to four thousand US dollars. And that's going to include the spit of converter as well as the DAC itself. And so based on that, you can see that it's not a cheap DAC by any stretch of the imagination. We're talking up there with something like a Chord Hugo 2. We're even not that far off a full-on Chord Hugo TT2. And so it needs to perform at a high level in order to justify its price tag and of course justify spending that much money on something that's got such an eccentric and interesting design. And so one of my big tests for this was to put it up next to the Court Hugo TT2 and see just how good it was. In isolation, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a deck that I found very engaging, very kind of musical and fun to listen to, but still technically strong as well. And so I connected up the TT2, I ran both of them into the Burson Soloist 3X GT, and from memory I was either running the Hyperman HE1000SEs, or I was running the Elites. It was probably the Elites, but I'm not sure. Either way, top tier headphones with a top tier headphone amp running from both DACs where I could switch between the two easily. And what I found as I switched back and forth was that the TT2 did pull just a little bit more texture and detail out of the music compared to the Abbas. And for this testing, I tried the TT2 with the M scaler and also without the M scaler just to see the difference. And so most of what I'm talking about here is just the TT2 on its own because obviously the M scaler adds a whole other layer of cost. I also didn't want to consider too much upsampling in this because the ABBA stack, I'm pretty sure from memory, is capped at 192 kilohertz. So it's not like you can send it a super upsampled signal from say HQ player or an M scaler for that matter. And then comparing the TT2 to the Abbas, I felt like the Abbas kind of held its own. It wasn't quite as good, but what it did was it had some character that the TT2 couldn't match. One of the tracks I tried during testing was actually from an album that Michael recommended to me when he sent me the DAC, and the track was Righteous Red Berets by Felix Laband. And in this track, there's a sampled sound that I'm pretty sure is a plucked cello, but it's got extra reverb and stuff added to it. And listening to the two different DACs, I felt like the TT2 was better picking up all of the detail, the attack of that particular plucked sound. It just came across with more texture and more clarity overall, that being from the TT2. As I flip back and forth more and more, listening to a whole lot of different tracks, I feel like the sound quality between the two isn't vastly different. As I said, there's a mid-range emphasis from the Abbas, but it's really holding up well against the TT2, and that's a pretty impressive feat. We've got really modern technology with super advanced filtering in the TT2, up against something made with a whole lot of old parts, a very old DAC chip, and tubes. Now definitely, as I've just said, the TT2 is extracting more detail, slightly more resolution, it is technically stronger in some ways, but it certainly didn't make the Abbas look like a joke, which it very easily could have if things hadn't been done well in here. Two areas where I did start to find I could separate the two easily was that with the TT2, and this is something that Rob Watts has talked about in my interviews with him and online in various forums, one of the things that the chord DACs focus on is the timing of transients. And one of the important benefits of that that Rob Watts talks about is the fact that our ears actually use the transient information and the harmonics within that sound to help reconstruct our understanding of bass. So it's not that they're hearing things that aren't already there. The point is we perceive bass by using frequencies that are higher, so some of the harmonics, to actually understand how deep the bass goes. And without that being really anywhere near my consciousness, it was something that jumped out to me as I listened to the two, 
was that on tracks with deep bass, the TT2 consistently sounded like it was going deeper. And based on some testing I did, I run some frequency sweeps through these. It's not about the fact that there's any major roll-off from the Abbas. All I can put it down to is the fact that the transient timing, the accuracy of that timing is better from the TT2, and therefore our ears are able, or our brain as it actually is, our brain is able to better perceive the depth of that bass because of the timing of those transients. Again, the Abbas isn't bad in this regard, but it's one area that I consistently find the TT2, and indeed any of the chord DACs, to do really well. So for those that love bass extension and depth, I do think it's worth spending a bit more on something like the chord. But for those that love that mid-range, and this is the other thing that really separated them, that's really the Abbas party piece. The quality of the mid-range and the way it separates the mid-range from the mix so you can really get lost in vocals, that's definitely a strength of the Abbas. It's a DAC that's an absolute dream on anything that's got a strong vocal performance, a good instrumental solo, or even just strong instrumental parts. It's lovely on orchestral music as well. It's just one of those DACs that I think is fantastic if you like a slightly leaner presentation with more mid-range emphasis. And I did a bit of playing around as well because I thought maybe this is just a tube thing. Maybe I can get exactly the same result by connecting up a different product like say the TT2 to a great tube amp like something like the recently reviewed LTA-MZ3 OTL tube amp or ZOTL tube amp. And so I tried the TT2 with the Micro ZOTL up against the Burson Solos 3X GT running with the tube DAC here in the Abbas. And there was a certain quality that I just couldn't get using a tube amp with a solid state DAC like the TT2. And so there's something about having the tubes at the front end of the chain at the DAC stage that's different, or at least maybe it's because it's the DAC itself. Maybe it's got nothing to do with whether it's tubes or not. But something about the quality of the Abbas as the DAC, I couldn't replicate using a tube amp at the other end. So keep that in mind if you're considering investing in one of these, picking one up second hand perhaps, then it is a DAC that's got a really unique and interesting sound signature. I don't think it's quite as resolving and technically capable as some of the modern, say, chord DACs or other fantastic DACs on the market, but it's definitely got a sense of character that you're probably never going to match from anything else. Whether that's a good thing, whether you want your DAC to have character, or whether you believe it should come later on in the chain with, say, your amp and or your headphones, I'm going to leave that up to you. But what I will say is that, for me at least, the Abbas DACs are the real deal. I don't know if they're a DAC that I would personally buy, but I absolutely wouldn't discourage anybody from buying one or owning one. I think they're a really fascinating piece of design. I love the care and the attention and detail that goes into them. And the end result, for me at least, is a sound that is undeniably appealing. And so again, I want to say a huge thanks to Michael for lending this to me. It's been a fascinating journey to discover this, get a chance to listen to it and understand it more. And hopefully you found the review useful and interesting as I did, because hopefully it's a bit of a discovery of something you'd never heard of, or maybe an understanding of a product that you'd heard of, but didn't really know how it fitted into the scheme of things. As always, if you did find the review useful or helpful, I'd love it if you hit the like button, and consider subscribing and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave you to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm-hmm.